Welcome to the Yes Effect Show. On this episode, we are trying something completely new. This is gonna be what I'm gonna call a grip it and rip it pod class. So what is a pod class, you ask? Great question, I'm so glad you asked. A pod class is a micro teaching of something that our listeners have put their hand up and said, yes, I really would like to know more about that. So you have spoken, we have heard you, we're gonna give it a spin around the dance floor. This week's pod class is going to be on the art of the interview. But before we get into that, I just wanted to first thank everybody for showing up week after week and supporting this show. It has been our absolute privilege to bring you some mind-blowing guests that show up, share their stories, and shine a light for all of us about what is actually possible when we get out of our own way. So with that said, we would love it if you hop on over and give us a rating or review. And also, if there is a subject that you wanna learn about, that you want us to deliver a pod class on, we would love to hear your feedback. We also look forward to serving as many people as possible. And one of the things that helps us do exactly that is if you hop on over and give us a rating or review wherever it is you listen to your podcasts. And lastly, Here at the Yes Effect Show, we are all about the concept of believe, belong, and become. So who is the one person that would benefit from hearing this very episode? Please share it with them. So without further ado, let's get into it. This pod class is the art of the interview. A magnetic interview is nothing more than a compelling conversation that occurs regardless of which side of the mic you are on. So as we get started, I want to first give you the context and the story for how this pod class came to be. My boy Sam is 10 years old, and one day he came home and he was asking me, Hey Shelly, how are the podcasts going? Like, how is that whole thing unrolling? Because he knew that I did a big relaunch, and he was super interested in what I was doing and how it was unfolding and was really curious about the process. So I shared with him about some of the incredible people that I'd had the opportunity to interview and to speak with, and also some of the profound takeaways and the impact they have on the listeners and the audience and the ripple effect of sharing these gems going forward. And he thought that was really cool. And so I said to him, if you had the opportunity to interview anybody, who would you interview? So Sam says, well, that's easy. It's Black History Month at school right now, and we have a project due, and the project is that we are to pick somebody out of history, out of Black history, that we find inspiring, and we have to do a presentation on them. So as a AAA goalie, the person that I would love to have the opportunity to speak with is Grant Fuhrer. So, being not a hockey enthusiast, I ask him, so what is it about Grant Fuhrer that you find so inspiring and intriguing, and why is he the person that you picked to interview? So he tells me that Grant Fuhrer is the first person of color to be inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame, and he went on to win five Stanley Cup trophies. So I sat with that for a while, and as a person who regularly reaches out to high-profile people to have them on this show, I thought, I wonder what the chances of having a 10 year old boy procure the ability to interview one of his hockey heroes. So after several hours of research and finding a bunch of contact information that potentially could have led to nothing, I put a pitch together and I started sending it out. So as a side note, I teach an entire workshop on how to write a pitch that lands. So I'm not gonna go into that today, but for the purpose of this pod class, Here's what happened next. I wake up in the morning and I check my emails and I have a response from one of the many pitches I've sent. And it was from Grant himself saying that he would love to give Sam the opportunity to interview him on the Yes Effect podcast. Now, if you listen to the end of this show, you will get to hear the actual interview that a 10 year old boy was able to conduct with one of his hockey heroes. But back to the story. So now I have to teach a 10 year old how to conduct a professional, vulnerable and magnetic interview with absolutely no experience whatsoever to draw from. So a teaching point for all of you listening, if a 10 year old boy can conduct a baller interview, so can you. So with very little prep time, I had to teach Sam how to own and steer a conversation. 
So we went over the five components of conducting an interview. So I'm going to list them out to you and then we'll go back and unpack each of them. So the first one is, what do you want to share and why? The second point is give context for the questions you're asking. The third point is have safety net questions ready. The fourth is make sure you're practicing active listening. And finally, have a parting statement prepared before you start. So let's start with what do you want to share and why? If we've reached out to somebody because we want to have them on our podcast or we want to conduct an interview or we want to turn over some rocks with them and really learn from their lived experience, we have to ask ourselves, what is it exactly that we were interested in them about? Is it their accomplishments? Is it who they are? Is it how they move through the world? And the thing to really, really hone in on when it comes to what we want to share is there is always a story going on beneath the obvious story. So using Grant Fuhrer as an example, the obvious reason that Sam wanted to interview him was because he was a person of color, he was a high level goalie, and he made hockey history. But when we look at the story beneath the story, we have to ask ourselves, why does it matter and why should we care? And when we ask ourselves those questions, we realize that there's a complete other layer to the story itself. And what it boils down to is universal relatability. So I said to Sam, what do you think were some of the experiences that maybe Grant had as one of the very first people of color to be performing at that level and in the NHL? So we talked about adversity and we talked about at the beginning of Grant's journey, perhaps he had to envision himself accomplishing something that he'd never actually seen before. And that from the outset, maybe he didn't see anybody who looked like him in the position that he aspired to. And that is something we can all relate to. We all know what it feels like to have big dreams that we're afraid we might not accomplish. We're all afraid to step into action fearing that we might not ever get there. We all know what it feels like to sometimes feel like we're on the outside looking into a place that we're not entirely sure we belong. So while the backstory surrounds itself around hockey, the actual story is around adversity and visioning and possibility and inclusion and persistence. When we start an interview with the idea of asking ourselves, what do we want to share and why, it becomes the North Star in which way the conversation goes and also how it lands. The next point we talked about was give context for your questions. Oftentimes when we're talking to somebody that we look up to or admire, we see their gifts sometimes in a way that they don't even see themselves. So it's possible that we ask them a question with these big grandiose ideas of how they're going to answer it, given that we assume that they see themselves the same way that we do. And oftentimes that isn't the case. So what I shared with Sam is when we ask a question before we do, we'll tell them a story that illustrates and shows them how we want them to answer the question. So in this case, the question that we wanted to ask was around the idea of holding a vision and overcoming adversity, even though racism still exists today. So I said to Sam, think of a time that either you've experienced or you've witnessed firsthand somebody who has experienced some sort of adversity in their lives or in their lived experience. So before we ask the question, we're going to paint a picture of a time when we've experienced something like the question we're about to ask them. My friend Justin Demers calls this giving somebody the gift of going second. When you ask a question in this way, not only does it make you relatable and show them that you've earned the right to ask them the question, it also creates a really comfortable conversation that sets them up in a position to win and to shine. The third thing we talked about is making sure you have a handful of safety net questions. Now these questions are exactly as they sound. 
In the event that you lose your place, you can't remember what you were about to say, or you completely blank out, you can always look down and have something prepared in advance. One of the tricks that I sometimes use is because I want to be present and in the moment, I don't necessarily want to be reading off a page. So what I'll do is I'll create a bunch of safety net questions, two, three, maybe four, and I will go over them a number of times in my mind so I kind of get the gist of them. Now, I still don't want to be looking down and reading them from a piece of paper. So what I'll do is I'll create a pictogram which is essentially nothing more than a number of pictures that are set up to create a mental trigger so you can look at them and at a glance, remember your question. If you wanna have a look at the pictogram we created for Sam's interview, you can check it out in the show notes at theyeseffectshow.com. The fourth thing we talked about, and this is huge in having really compelling interviews, is the art of active listening. One of the biggest mistakes that a lot of interviewers make will have their questions prepared and in concrete and they just fire them off one after the next after the next. The problem with that is it creates the vibe of I'm not listening to your answer, but rather I'm waiting to ask you my next question. Active listening is so much easier to do when you've prepared your safety net questions in advance. What that allows you is to springboard through the conversation and expand on what they said and see where it takes you. Oftentimes you'll end up down a rabbit hole with somebody and you will hear something that sounds like, oh, that's a good question. I've never been asked that before because you're not asking them predictable templated questions. You're actually listening for what they're saying in the moment. And once again, what is the story beneath the story? And finally, we talked about have a parting statement ready before you start. A parting statement is a really gentle way to land the plane and summarize for the audience what we've talked about, who they are, and why it matters to them. It's the idea that your audience gets no jobs. So we've taken them on this beautiful journey and we've excavated all kinds of gems and stories. And now we're going to finish it up by putting a nice bow on it and summarizing what we talked about and the key takeaways. And of course, asking them if they have any last parting words and thanking them for their time. So if you've ever wondered what it would be like to interview your hero, be inspired by 10 year old Sam and enjoy his conversation with hockey legend, Grant Fuhr. As a child, today's guest had big dreams. He wanted to be an NHL goalie. But as a person of color, he never saw anyone who looked like him. But he went on to be inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame and win five Stanley Cup trophies. Now, he's a trailblazer showing other people how to have faith in their dreams. His name is Grant Fuhr, and this is the Yes Effect Show. Um, so one of the questions that I really want to ask you is, um, so Shelly here um, um, is the first female firefighter, and, um, and so she um, had some hardships in that. And so um, I got to hear and see that. Um, and so you're like one in a million um, to rise up from all of the ranks. Um, how did you hold your belief and um, how would you give advice, even though racism still exists, to um, someone aspiring to be something? I think the biggest thing you got to do is you got to believe in yourself. Mm. I mean, I know a lot of the kids that I talk to and stuff, some of them kind of doubt themselves a little bit and I tell them to believe in themselves. And I think that's the biggest thing you can do is you have to trust what you're doing. And regardless of what people tell you, you got to believe and you have to have dreams. Um, going off of that question. Um, what were your dreams in your childhood? Well, I went to play in the NHL from about the time I was six on. So, I mean, I, I had a lot of teachers tell me that that probably wasn't going to be possible and that I should probably worry about my studies and such. So I'll say I was a bad student, but a student of the game of hockey. So for me, it worked out well. Um, I actually wanted to ask you something about that. So that's that's something I find 
uh, people that are outside of like the box um, experience a lot. So for me, uh, I was a 108 pound manicurist and a friend, I wanted to become a firefighter, but just thought it wasn't possible until that moment that somebody said to me, who was in a position to know, said, um, uh, there's going to be a girl one day, why wouldn't it be you? And it was almost like this ignition point. Um, how did you know in those moments when, you know, people were saying, oh, you know, you've ever heard people say, well, you should have a plan B or just make sure. But here's the thing, the people that rise to the top that are the best, like I was just saying to Sam, like, like hundreds of thousands of goalies and all of them, you know, from A to double A to triple A to Canada to US who want to play high level hockey, want to get into the NHL and ultimately want to win the Stanley Cup. If you were to trace the route back to that moment when your teachers are um, are telling you, well, you should maybe have a plan B and you're like, nope, I know what I know like I know it. What advice would you give to those kids who are being told the same thing right now? I think it's still good to have a plan B. I mean, I'm that weird guy that didn't have the plan B. It was plan A the whole time. So, right. But a lot of the kids I talk to, you still have to get an education. I think that's the biggest thing but you still have to push for your dreams. I mean, the biggest thing is not letting anybody discourage you. And I think you see, you see a lot of kids, yes, the game's getting very expensive, so it's hard on parents. But at the same time, you still have to believe in what you wanna do. And if you put your heart and soul into it, I still believe you can accomplish whatever. Hmm. That's amazing. So Sam plays triple A goal and his number is? 31, just like yours. Good choice. <laughs> so Wayne Gretzky, one of the um, best athletes ever, um, who ever lived, said that you were the best athlete ever, and he, you were one of the best athletes that he's ever played with, and you had natural skills um, like saving the puck, <laughs> and um, you visualize yourself in the NHL, but you couldn't really see any goalies of color in the NHL. So how did you see that that was possible for you? Uh, you know what? I played a lot of different sports. So I played lots of baseball. I played football. I played hockey. Some of them all at the same time. So I tried to become a well-rounded athlete. But my dream was hockey. So that's where 90% of my focus went to was hockey. But I also believe that you can't play it year-round or you burn yourself out. So by playing other sports, it allowed me to become a better athlete. But at the same time, without losing focus on what I really wanted to do. And again, it goes back to my parents supported me. Even though we may have had some conversations about education and such that of course. Needed, to, needed to be had. But at the same time, they encouraged me the whole way. So I, I just never let myself doubt it. And I get to know Glenn Hall as a kid. He lived about three miles from us. So... I had the opportunity to kind of pick his brain a little bit. Wow, that's really cool. Um, so um, a question is, did you drop out of high school like some of the other goalies that I've read about? I turned pro out of high school. I mean, I was in finished high school when I turned pro. So, and I, what did I leave? I left just after grade 10 to turn pro. So it would be a little different alternative than dropping out of high school. It was either get paid to play professional hockey or finish high school. And it's pretty easy decision. When you, um, I'm, I'm sure you've talked to like tons and tons of kids. Is there any trick or um, any tactic you have as far as visualizing something that you've never seen before? So, so for me, just as an example, like I'd never... I'd never seen a firefighter that looked like me and everybody's like, well, you know, the chances of you making it, the odds, the logic, the whatever, I'm 5'2". And so my, uh, my technique was every single night before I went to bed, I would practice feeling what it felt like to get that phone call and just getting my teeth kicked in again and again and learning all of the things that, you know, I didn't know that I needed to know. Was there anything that you did or any advice you could give to other people who are just like, you know, I, I heard most of your body at some point has been reconstructed, right? So there was- yeah, we're, we're remodeled a little bit now. <laughs> yeah, struggles and hard times. 
Um, what do you do, like, or what advice would you give those people who want something so bad and they see it and they feel it, but they come up against those struggles or those hardships? Um, what did you do to push through and, and what were your sort of visualization techniques when times were really, really tough? See, I was lucky. I played at a time when politics didn't and wasn't in the minor league game. So I could play in three or four different leagues. So I always played with kids older than I was. Oh. And I figured if I could compete with them, then I had a chance. So I could play in two or three different leagues. Like when I played Bantam, I also played with the midgets. I also played with the juveniles and then played a little bit of junior at the same time too. So I played seven days a week when I was playing, but at the same time, I'm big on sports psychology and visualization is a huge part where you see yourself playing at the next level all the time. And I think that was the biggest thing is that I believed I could play at that next level and push myself to it. This is one of the questions that I really want to ask you. Um, since you're like one of the greatest goalies that ever lived, do you have any advice for um, an aspiring young goalie like me? Yeah, you have to enjoy it. I think that's the biggest thing is I had fun every day. Right, right up until I retired. Once I retired, the body was not having fun anymore. So that's that's why it was time to get out. But I made a point of enjoying going to the rink every day and looking forward to it. And I think sometimes right now where parents are pushing so hard, the kids forget that they're supposed to have fun while they're playing. Mm. And I think that's the biggest thing is you have to enjoy going to the rink every day and look forward to it. Um. So your dad sacrificed a lot to get you to your games. Um, and he always gave you advice. He always had your back. Um. What was the absolute best advice that he ever gave you? And if you could give him one last message, what would it be? I think the biggest thing is my parents drove me all over the place. I mean, minor hockey covers a lot of miles. And that's the one thing is they took the time out of their day to do it. And if they hadn't done that, then obviously I wouldn't have had the chance to play in all the different leagues. And I mean, I'd go to practice before school, go to school, practice after school and then play games at night. So without them running me around and basically taking time out of their day and sacrificing for that, I didn't ever get that opportunity. So, I mean, that's that was the best thing as I had supportive parents the whole time. Mm. And you have to have that. You have to have the people to take their time out. I mean, I had lots of good coaches and lots of great guys to play with. So the biggest thing is if you get that help, you've got to take advantage of it. And you got to be appreciative of it. I'd be thank you. That's the easiest part. I mean, without their sacrifice, obviously, I'd have never played pro hockey. So we, we weren't very well off at that time. And they sacrificed things so that I could play, get new equipment, all that stuff. So thank you would be the biggest thing. When you retired um, and after you stopped coaching, did golf, like competitive golf, like fill that um, – hole for competition it did i mean when you're competitive your whole life you've got to have something that you can be competitive at and for me it was golf so it kind of filled that void and felt like i was starting over again because everybody else had been playing golf their whole life where i had a different career so i ended up having to work a little bit harder chasing them and it just gave me something to be competitive at and something to work at but it, it speaks to what you said earlier about playing with people that are just a little bit better than you i know you you talked about you know, you'd play in, in uh, age groups that were a little bit more advanced than you and kind of the same thing this round, right? It gives you something to chase and something to up-level yourself with. It does, and I still play with guys that are a little bit better than me. I've got a bunch of friends that play on the PGA Tour, so to play with them and see how good they really are and know that I can some days compete with them but will probably never, ever be as good, it's still fun to give me something competitive at. And also, if they ever chirp you, you can remind them of that whole, like, Stanley Cup thing. It's nice to have in your back pocket, just in case. <laughs> For sure. Thank you so much. Um, seeing my mentor, like, actually talk to me is, like, huge. And um, you're just so cool. Like, I want to be like you when I'm older. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> The middle age me would be good. So the old me, I'm not sure you'd want any part of that. There's a lot of new parts and such. That, so there wasn't some, some fun in that, but it's well, great. 
Well, listen, we super appreciate your time. We know uh, you've got stuff on the go, but it means the world to, to me and to obviously Sam that you took the time to come and hang out and we really appreciate you. That's my pleasure. Good luck with your hockey. Hope all goes well, Sam. Thank you. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today on The Yes Effect Show. If you like this episode, it'd be amazing if you could rate it, review it, and share it with a friend wherever you listen to your podcasts. And lastly, if you want a behind-the-scenes look, we're going to continue the conversation in the Facebook group, The Yes Effect Inner Circle. So hop on over there, a place to believe, belong, and become.